And so the first thing we'd like to do today is uh, let Barry Dykes uh, say a few words about BioWest, and, uh, and we can all thank BioWest for putting this uh, big spread together for us. Well, we're glad to uh, be able to host you out here with us in our headquarters. We've been here for about um, six months, seven months now. We came in in January, so uh, we love the view. We're pretty proud of the place, and we're glad we could have all of you out here. BioWest, if you don't know anything about us, is one of the largest uh, privately held managed services providers in the country. We're mostly in the West Coast, but serve cu customers across all of the U.S. and even overseas. Um, we do run IPv6 natively, which is what Scott's going to want to know. And so, uh, you know, uh, we're there. We're glad to support you guys and uh, glad that you're here. Thanks. Yeah. Um, so thank you for Via West and the uh, Colorado Internet Society for having me here today. Um, I'm going to talk to you about IPv6 and really, hopefully, share with you, you know, that IPv6 is something that is inevitable and an eventuality, not something that is a that is a maybe going to happen. And so I'm going to going to talk to you about IPv6 uh, and share with you a little bit about the current state of adoption and and hopefully uh, impart on you the the idea that IPv6 really is being used and it, and it's now is the time to start our planning and implementing uh, IPv6 uh, in our organizations. Um, to talk about IP version 6, or the next version of the internet protocol, we, it kind of presumes that there's something wrong with the previous version. <laughs> and so we need to talk a little bit about internet protocol version 4 uh, that we use on the internet. IPv4 address uh, depletion is occurring around the world. Uh, really, as I explain it to, to my mom, who doesn't use computers all that much, you know, the internet's running out of phone numbers. <laughs> you know, the, the density of the population on the current internet is growing, with 7 billion people on the planet, many mobile devices. Each of these systems requires public addresses to communicate, you know, on the, on the internet. And so the world is getting tighter and tighter, and there's, and there's more and more density. Uh, the Internet Assigned Number Authority allocates uh, with ICANN address space to the five regional registries, and those re that address space has been fully allocated now, and the regional registries are now uh, starting to run out of address space that they offer to their Internet service providers and organizations that operate in those geographies. And so, it's starting to get tighter and tighter. Uh, last year, Asia Pacific NIC is, is now in the stage two conservation mode of their address space. Uh, right will, uh, will likely be in that space maybe in the next month or so. Uh, the American Registry for Internet Numbers here in North America has a little bit uh, further to go. They have three what we call slash eight equivalents uh, remaining. Um, the Internet population is continuing to increasingly become more dense as more international communities join the Internet. Uh, there's a lot of, you know, population in Africa, Latin America, Asia, uh, Europe and even in North America that still haven't joined the, the internet. And so that's going to cause a problem because we, we want the internet to be something that is, you know, available to everyone. Uh, and there'll be these restrictions artificially imposed because there's a lack of address space to join people and things and uh, systems to the internet. Um, the IPv4 address blocks will continue to become more and more fragmented as organizations you know, share or trade addresses or transfer ownership of addresses to each other, the address space becomes more and more fragmented, which makes the internet routing tables more and more populous. Um, and these lack of available addresses really restricts innovation. You can't come up with many new systems that might require public addresses in this type of an environment where you're limited. Uh, so many organizations need to consider if you're not going to get another allocation of IPv4 public addresses, even for an enterprise who might be using that or a service provider that needs addresses to connect uh, customers you know, and their subscribers to the internet, uh, do you have enough IPv4 addresses to last indefinitely? Because how much longer do you think you're going to use IPv4? I don't think anyone has any intention of turning it off. And an IS ISP who's going to join customers to the internet is going to need addresses to connect them to the IPv4 internet for the next 15, 20, 30 years. So do you have enough, does your organization, even though you might be using network address translation at your internet perimeter, do you have enough addresses, IPv4 addresses, that'll last you for the next 20 years? 
you don't know what your organization may do or how you may grow or how you may com you know, continue to communicate on the internet, but you want to make sure that your organization is able to communicate with the broadest uh, population of folks on the internet, and you need addresses to do that. Um, so here's kind of a, a, a picture, a graph that shows the growth of the IPv4 routing table. You know, we see here early on, you know, the early uh, stages of the internet in the early 90s. Then we kind of see in 1994, we see the in introduction of classless interdomain routing to kind of level off that, that slope that was building. We see the internet bubble grow, you know, in the late 90s. We see the dot bomb there levels off the rate of IPv4 addresses in the internet routing table. Then we see the dot bomb wasn't much of a, was not much of a, of a bust area. The, the, the curve continued to grow. You see a little tick there in 2009 in the last few years. That's, that represents the you know, global economic uh, conditions that we are in today. And you can see that even if the economy is going bad, the BGP routing table doesn't reflect that slowing of, of you know, global economies. Uh, so you can see that this graph uh, is going up at a fairly steep rate, and so all of the routers on the internet have to hold this amount of routes uh, and, and share these routes with their peer, so it increases the, the requirements for an internet router to be able to hold this, this information about all places uh, on the internet. What do you think this graph is going to do over the next 15, 20, 30 years? Because we're not going to turn IPv4 off at any point here. So where does this go as the as addresses become tighter and tighter and people start to trade them and chop them up? Oh, I have a slash 24, I'll split it in half, I'll give you a 25, and I'll keep a 25 slash 25 for myself. We'll divide up addresses that way, and they'll become, now there'll be two routes in the routing table instead of just one slash 24 or something. I mean, this is just an example. Um, ISPs are running out of address space, and they're at a point where, you know, that really limits their ability to grow their business. Uh, shareholders and stuff done for those large service providers don't want to see that there's some limit on the number of subscribers they can connect. Uh, so uh, many subscribers use network address translation or port address translation inside their homes, these private addresses internally, and a, to a single public address that the service provider provides that subscriber, and that, that address may be static or not. Uh, but the ISPs really have no alternative to grow their business to connect more people to the internet and they're going to start to give them private private address space, or rather this RSC 6598, this, this 10.64 address space, and then deploy what's called carrier-grade NAT or large-scale NAT systems in the core of their network to perform another level of translation to a pool of public addresses. Sometimes it's re this is referred to as NAT 444 because there's really four different addresses. There's the private address used inside the subscriber's home, there's the 10.64 address space that might be used inside the service provider's core, and then there's the public address that eventually gets translated to when the packet reaches the internet. Uh, ISPs will de deploy this costless, costly equipment and maintain it, and during this period, ISPs must figure out how to, how to manage the, this, uh, this infrastructure with these large uh, NAT systems in the core of their network. Um, Subscribers may experience issues as a result of these uh, large-scale NAT, NAT systems and may call their help desk of their service provider to help troubleshoot these problems. The subscribers may not be sophisticated uh, as the folks listening to, this <laughs> listening to this presentation. They may have difficulty determining what, you know, oh, my internet is down and call their service provider to help them troubleshoot my internet being down. Uh, and that's going to you know, add a burden to the service provider because the customer feels that the internet service provider is their link to the internet. Uh, so it'll bear some extra operational costs, not just in addition to capital expenditure of deploying these systems, there'll be significant operational expenses that the service providers will uh, incur to troubleshoot these, these problems and maintain these costly systems indefinitely. They'll need to maintain these until, you know, before people stop using V4, which is, is not uh, anytime here soon. So the cost of doing business with IPv4 will continue to increase as the cost of buying or, or borrowing addresses increases. Uh, it'll make also troubleshooting networks using multiple layers of NAT more, more complicated and stuff for organizations. Uh, CGNs, LSNs impact uh, 
a bunch of different applications negatively. You can see the list here. Um, subscribers can't host services at their locations, breaks IPsec, lack of peer-to-peer -peer type applications, online gaming, basically anything that requires a public address inside of the, for the subscriber is, is broken. Prevents geolocation, uh, other things like that. Any, uh, also in, uh, affects IPv6 tunneling techniques that might need a public address uh, to operate. So IPv6 is this next uh, generation internet protocol that's for use on the internet, uh, standardized by the Internet Engineering Task Force in the, in the mid to late uh, 90s. And this is an alternative. Uh, IPv6 has an abundance of, IP, of addresses. The addresses are much larger in terms of their the number of bits in their address. And we can have you know, many, um, many, many IPv6 addresses, 340 undecillion addresses. So a virtual you know, endless supply of addresses, if you will. Um, IPv6 has had more than a decade to mature because it's not just about creating the IPv6 protocol. All the other protocols that support IPv6 and, and communication between two IPv6 nodes on the internet needed to be developed. So once the IPv6 core protocol got developed, then we needed things like DNS and DHCP and routing protocols and other functions to make the entire system work. We needed IPv6 to be integrated into routers, into software, into host OSs and server operating systems. We needed the root name servers to become v6 capable. Much of that infrastructure now has been upgraded and those systems now have IPv6 capabilities built into them. It's taken a while. And really our plan for transitioning from v4 to v6, because we're never going to be able to turn IPv4 off, at least in the foreseeable future, is to run both simultaneously and make our systems be bilingual and communicate to both. And if you make a system be bilingual, it's equally happy communicating either language. And uh, DNS infrastructure will help us help nodes determine whether they should make a connection over IPv6 or IPv4. But we're in this awkward period where v4 address exhaustion is occurring, but we haven't rolled out IPv6 on a massive scale. In, you know, and so we're caught in the middle here. And we've put off until the last possible moment this migration to IPv6. Um, and so that's, that's kind of where we're at today, and it's a difficult spot for us to be in. IPv6 has some uh, advantages. I mentioned virtual endless supply of IP addresses. And those public addresses will be used for native communication on the internet. Because we have an abundance of addresses, we don't need to do network address translation or, or anything of that sort. We use public addresses and communicate natively between systems. Because of the abundance of addresses, it'll allow us to, to innovate and continue to roll out new systems, uh, applications that flourish you know, with NAT, without NAT, you know, peer-to-peer, mobility, um, you can, anything you can think of that requires a massive amount of address space, home automation, power system meters, sensor networks, uh, internet of things, you know, this concept that now it's no longer just client, server, end user to a server, you know, communicating on the internet. There's the internet of things that's developing. Emergency services. Imagine if, you know, the police and the fire department and the ambulance all showed up at some emergency event and they were all using NAT and they couldn't communicate natively with each other and didn't facilitate this ad hoc network being built to, to handle this emergency situation. We want them to be able to communicate natively with each other. If they each had their own pro, you know, public addresses, they could do that very easily, create an ad hoc network and, and uh, communicate and collaborate uh, effectively. There are many other applications you can think of that IPv6 would facilitate. So IPv6 has had time to mature. The log jam is kind of broken between content providers, network operators, end users. IPv6 has been enabled, or it has been uh, implemented into many of the products that we have in our infrastructure. And we can see that organizations are starting to get on the IPv6 internet. We can see the number of address allocations that have been given by the regional registries uh, to the companies that operate in those geographies. And that's really gone up in recent years. So companies are ramping up getting their addresses. As soon as they get their addresses, they need to be able to advertise those addresses to the internet. And we see that. We see the number of uh, routes on the IPv6 routing table, internet routing table, increasing in recent years. And we see the number of autonomous system numbers that are, uh, that are actively using IPv6 and advertising IPv6 routes increasing. So out of the 42,000 
autonomous system numbers. 6,000 uh, there, so maybe around 15% of the internet, of the internet autonomous systems, are starting to use IPv6, or at least advertising that they have uh, ownership and, and route some IPv6 address space to them. Hurricane Electric has some statistics where they report the number of top-level domains, 80-some percent of top-level domains are V6 capable, 14% of autonomous systems are advertising V6, 74% um, of IPv6 uh, name or our DNS name servers well, where V6 is faster or faster than V4, so we see some performance gains because of native IPv6. And well, three to four percent of the top one million websites on the internet are starting to use IPv6. And, and now since World IPv6 uh, launch, uh, five of the top six uh, websites in the world are now using both protocols in a bilingual way. Our federal government is striving to reach IPv6 uh, and provide IPv6 connectivity to their internet edge systems for email and web. They have a mandate where they're striving to v6 enable those systems by the end of September. You can see that you know it's it's slow, but you see that they're gaining. You know, web and email systems are starting to come online, but they've got a ways to go. But they're really going to be pushing more and more content to be v6 capable here, and this graph will change quite a bit in the next 30 days. Um, uh, my friend Eric Bank from uh, Belgium maintains a site that kind of keeps track of percentages of IPv6 internet traffic that can be seen. Of course, the amount of IPv6 traffic you'll see at any particular measurement point varies based on where you're doing your measurements. In some places in Europe, the percentages of IPv6 native traffic can be quite high because those service providers have embraced IPv6 and are providing IPv6 connectivity to their subscribers. Uh, you know, for example, Comcast, after World IPv6 launch, now has uh, maybe one and a half percent of their backbone traffic is IPv6. So you start to see those figures increase as more and more content becomes v6 capable, as service providers deploy more and more v6 services, and, and v6 enable those, those end users that are generating uh, the traffic, getting to those sites. So in conclusion here, IPv6 is not a passing fad. It's not something that's, that's going to go away. There's no IP version 7 or IP version 8 that might be out there lingering and you can skip over this version waiting for the next service pack or something like that. There is no alternative. You can keep using IPv4 for you know years to come, but eventually you will have to migrate at some point because the vast majority of systems just can't continue the existence of IPv4 uh, for, for an inevitable period of time. But like I said before, we're in this awkward period where we have not widely, you know, we have some IPv6 that's deployed, but um, many organizations are still dependent on IPv4, and, and you really don't see that tipping point of people starting to give up IPv4 in favor of IPv6 until more and more systems become bilingual. So um, what we want to do is have more and more systems at least become bilingual, and then that gives us an opportunity to start the migration. Um, the global IPv6 transition is already underway, you know, in, in the U.S. And, and around the world, you see traffic volumes increasing every, every year. Um, and IPv6 internet already exists, uh, just your organization may not be connected to it, or your systems may not be leveraging it. But there is an IPv6 internet, and it largely just parallels the existing IPv4 internet. The same wire communicates v4 and v6 uh, packets on that same uh, 10 gig or 40 gig backbone link in that service provider's core network. Your network, your hosts, your infrastructure, the, the components that you make your environment out of are already V6 capable in many cases. Uh, the vendors have provided you that capability and as long as you've kept continually updating the software on your, on your network devices and servers and, and desktops, you, that has creeped into your environment. And to the, to the extent that you may have some IPv6 running on your internal network and you might not know that it's there. So uh, security may be an issue too, uh, and we want to plan that before we uh, plan how to secure IPv6 before we you know, roll it out. But the vendors have given us those tools, now it's just a matter of turning on IPv6. Service providers have these initial IPv6 deployments and you see that many of the service providers are advertising IPv6 address space and are v6 enabling downstream uh, customers. Um, organizations are migrating to IPv6 
so that they can share their content and communicate and do business with the broadest population on the internet. You don't want to be limited so that your business can only do business with people who are communicating IPv4. You, if you're selling something on the internet, if you're doing business on the internet, if you're an international organization, you're going to want to um, be able to you know, communicate fluently with both versions. You're going to want your products to be able to be purchased by people who are using v4 or v6. Um, so that's my premise, and I encourage you to start planning your transition to IPv6 sooner rather than later to preserve your, your business and to provide business continuity to your organizations uh, going forward. And so I think now is the time to start to deploy IPv6. If you'd, you know, and, you, and for every organization, you want to find that sweet spot on when to start to plan and roll out IPv6. If you're too early on the graph, you know, you want to be, you don't want to be the bleeding edge, you know, but, but you don't want to be a late, uh, latecomer to IPv6 because you may be um, suffering some business consequences as a result of your, your limited communication capabilities. So I think now you see that the graph is starting to go like this on many of those, those graphs, and you see that it's starting to pick up. Now's the time when you need to start planning, because you're not going to be able to roll out IPv6 maybe next week. If for some organizations, it may be quick like that, but it may take you some time you know, to plan it and do it the right way uh, and make sure it's, it's methodical and disciplined and it, and it runs, uh, runs really seamlessly. So I encourage you all to start to learn more about IPv6, uh, learn how it's, how it's similar and different uh, from IPv4, um, and, and now's a good time to start. Um, here's my contact information. We'll be providing this, uh, this presentation to you electronically. Uh, as Chris mentioned, I'm affiliated with the Rocky Mountain IPv6 Task Force, uh, authored a book on v6 security. I read a blog for Network World on v6 uh, subjects. I'm also part of the InfoBlox IPv6 Center of Excellence. So here's my contact information. Feel free to reach out to me if ever I can point you in the right direction and help your organization get, get planning on IPv6. Perfect. It's a little quiet, Shannon, but we can we can hear you well. So okay. we're going to move into the panel section here, and it's going to be kind of an open uh, discussion among the audience and again these uh, experts on the panel. On uh, from video feed here, we've got uh, Shannon McFarland, who's a principal engineer in the uh, corporate consulting engineering group at uh, at Cisco, and uh, he's focused on enterprise IPv6 deployments uh, as well as many other things, including VDI, OpenStack, and data center technologies. Uh, he's been doing uh, IPv6 at Cisco for 11 years now, and uh, we're definitely pleased to have him, even if it's uh, via the video here. Um, also, I'd like to bring up uh, Jeff Doyle, if I can, um, who's also a member of the panel. Uh, Jeff Doyle has uh, designed and uh, assisted in the design of large-scale IP service provider networks in 26 countries on six continents, um, and has worked with early adopters in IPv6 all around the world, including uh, Japan, China, South Korea, and then too many more to list. So he's now uh, advising service providers, government agencies, military contractors, and uh, basically everyone who's, who's rolling out uh, IPv6 and giving everyone uh, best practices, and he'll share some of that with us today as well. Um, I'd also like to reintroduce uh, Scott Hogue, who's going to join us on the panel, um, and who you already uh, are somewhat familiar with, hopefully. And, uh, and, uh, and Cricket Lou, uh, who is uh, an authority on the domain name system um, and uh, the uh, Vice President of Architecture and Technology at InfoBlox, working on IPv6 um, for a number of years there, and uh, also an author of um, the Nutshell Handbooks on DNS um, for both Classic DNS and Bind. So again, another uh, world-class industry expert that's here to share his, his knowledge with us. And uh, so again, if, if there's anyone who has questions right off the bat, I'd like to go ahead and, uh, and open up the floor. And if not, I've got several that I'd like to get answered, so. Yeah, we'll just have to pass the mic <laughs> back and forth across. Yeah. Thank you, Scott. So are there any questions? Anybody have any uh, initial questions? Maybe anything spurred by, uh, by Scott's talk or anything, uh, any burning questions they came with today? Okay, um, so so let me get started here. Uh, I, know, I noticed in Scott's talk there, you, you mentioned that uh, the global pool of IPv4 addresses has run out, 
and, uh, and APNIC, the Asia Pacific region, has run out of IPv4 addresses. But, uh, but Aaron, right, the, the, the basic North American registry for internet numbers, still has IPv4 addresses. So, so why are we here talking about IPv6? Why don't we just uh, keep using up those addresses? So, so the argument that I, that I usually make yeah, I is, is that better? So, so the argument that I, I've tried out recently is that um, yes, you know, Aaron does have a supply of IPv4 address space that will probably last us until sometime next year. But you know, as as Scott said, most of the rest of the world is out, right? If you if you run the numbers, APNIC, right, the regional internet registry that is in fact basically out of IPv4 address space, uh, is home to about 60% of the world's population. So 60% of 7 billion people, that's about 4.2 billion people. They also have pretty much the lowest internet penetration of any regional internet registry except for Africa, which serves Africa. So their internet penetration throughout the service area is about 26%. So 74% of people who live in APNIC service area still have to get uh, internet access. That's about 3.1 billion people who need internet access in, in Asia Pacific, and the only way they're going to get it is via IPv6. So if you work for a company that doesn't care about Asia and doesn't care about Europe starting in uh, October 1st, then you can probably put your head in the sand and not worry about it. But if you have customers who might be trying to reach your website, send you electronic mail, or what have you from, from the Asia Pacific region or increasingly uh, from Europe, Middle East, then you need to be thinking about IPv6. You need to treat them as equal citizens, basically, because they're always going to have a better user experience coming to your website, sending you electronic mail, if they're using a native IPv6 stack, and so are you. If they have to go from IPv6 to IPv4, they have to go through some sort of you know, kludgy transition technology that's going to slow them down. It's going to be a bottleneck. It's you know potentially going to be a, a single point of failure. So. You guys want to amplify that or counter it? No, I thought that was great. Just a follow-up question on that, though. But less than one percent of the internet community is on V6. So how is it hurting Asia back then? Well, remember that that this is a relatively recent thing. That APNIC ran out of IP before about April fifteenth of twenty eleven. So they've been out for you know, a year and change. Um, the, the way that the trickle down works, you know, Air, uh, uh, IANA, the Internet Assigned Members Authority, ran out first. The RIR still had IPv4 address space and they allocated that. Then uh, various service providers within their service areas still probably had some IPv4 address space, but they're quickly running out too. Um, at this point, every RFP we see coming out of Asia Pacific has IPv6 as a requirement. Um, you know, we've got large ISP customers in, in the Asia Pacific region like Bardia, Airtel, China Mobile, places like that, that are growing very, very quickly and you know, don't have any more IPv4 address space. So we're, we're at the beginning of, of that hockey stick, I think. And what we'll probably see over the next several years is hundreds of millions of subscribers in Asia Pacific uh, with native IPv6 connectivity. And of course, the other thing is that you know, IPv6 is, is, is opportunistic, right? They may have native IPv6 connectivity today, but when they reach you, they have to do it via IPv4. If your web ser server only supports IPv4, they've got to come through one of those transition technologies. So if we're measuring on the backbone of the internet, we never, never see the fact that they're actually running a native IPv6 stack. Isn't most of that stuff self-contained in their own network from a v6 standpoint? I mean, again, a lot of the content providers are slowly migrating over to v6, but it's going to take them years to even get over there as well. So they're, they're kind of stuck in the same boat everybody else is, that they have to stay on v4 because the eyeball traffic is still v4. Well, uh, the key there is that y they wouldn't simply swap one for the other, right? They'd implement dual stack. Right. They would run both v4 and v6 in parallel, and then they'd be able to satisfy native IPv4 or native IPv6 clients equally. Um, and it doesn't really take very much to do that. And then, you know, let's say, for example, you're, you know, the next great website for, you know, selling shoes on the internet. If you are, uh, you know, such a, a merchant and you support both native IPv4 and native IPv6, you will always have an advantage over somebody who's only supporting 
IPv4 if you're dealing with somebody who's got a native IPv6 stack, right? Because you, you know, to go to to go to the v4 only site, they're going to have to go through one of those transition technologies with, you know, hundreds of thousands of their closest friends and subscribers. So, um, it, it, let's say I'm not convinced yet, right? Um, you, you talked a lot about transition technologies. Uh, Scott, you mentioned CGN as well and LSN. So if there are ways to extend the life of IPv4 without IPv6, uh, why, are we, you know, again, why, why, why IPv6? Why isn't, uh, you know, just layers of NAT and segmenting uh, the internet that way uh, uh, the right path forward? Yeah, it's, that's actually a really good question, and um, it's just kind of continuing with, um, with, with what you guys were talking about, as far as, uh, you know, you've got people that are starting to use IPv6 simply because that's what their service providers are giving them, because that's the only way for service providers to continue expanding their customer base at this point, is, is to start deploying IPv6. And yet, as you mentioned, most of the content out on the internet is still IPv4. Um, and so a large challenge for service providers is, um, you know, how do I deploy IPv6 to my customers but make sure they can still reach IPv4 content? And, um, and the answer is large-scale NAT. Uh, and Scott mentioned uh, one of the architectures that are being used, which is uh, NAT444, which is basically a two-layer uh, NAT architecture. Uh, the problem is that there are applications, well, one of the problems, and this kind of goes to, a, to a, a business case for enterprises and IPv6. Um, one of the problems with these two-layer uh, NAT architectures is that there's a lot of applications that break in them. And so if you're an enterprise um, and you have applications that suddenly don't work through uh, the customer you know, applications that, that suddenly don't work through this new architecture, the customers don't really, uh, are, or are not going to blame their service provider uh, who has actually deployed large scale NAT in their network, uh, they're gonna blame you. Uh, which means if you're a bank and suddenly your customers can't do their online banking because some application broke, uh, you know, the customers are gonna say, well, you know, this, this worked before, it doesn't work now, there's something wrong with that with that banking system. And, and so one of the cases for IPv6 in the enterprise, even if you're not needing it for expanding your, your uh, IP address space um, or so forth, is you need to start serving those IPv6 users natively. And as, as Cricket said right now, most of where you're seeing IPv6 users, users crop up is uh, Asia. Um, you know, you'll, you'll see IPv6 users cropping up very quickly uh, in Europe and, and uh, you know, you'll, and very quickly after that, uh, North America. And so the time to really start preparing for those users, which will increase very quickly, uh, is now. Uh, so, that, so that you have time uh, to prepare your systems gracefully for that rather than you know, having to do it in panic mode. Um, it was one of the points on bullet points on one of my slides, but I didn't hit on it or emphasize it. But I do see impacts for enterprises today that use an extranet. They build a VPN over the internet to tie their branch locations together. They get broadband internet service, you know, internet access service uh, from whatever DSL or cable uh, provider is in wherever their stored locations are. They build an IPsec uh, land to land tunnel, a VPN, back to their corporate headquarters. And I've seen some of these international organizations now, when they deploy a site overseas, get, can't get a static public IPv4 address from their service providers. They can get public IPv6, but they can't get a static uh, non-expiring or non-changing IPv4 address. So unless they maybe go to a higher grade of service and then pay more, a, month, a higher, much higher monthly service, to get a static IPv4 address from those providers. Go to a business class, which then changes their whole cost model and, and makes those stores' operational costs more expensive to build that VPN. One solution I've offered to those folks is, well, v6 enable your VPN here in the United States, and then you could tunnel that v4 traffic inside a v6 tunnel to bring that, build a VPN over v6, because those will never change. Ask your service provider if you can get 
public, you know, static, non-changing V6 addresses and just tunnel in the opposite direction. But yeah, we're starting to see international businesses be impacted by the shortage of uh, public IPv4 addresses for extranets. I have a, a couple of stories about about companies who, who went through just that. One company I went to visit, they're a big Midwestern manufacturer of big green tractors, um, who I won't name, but you can probably figure out who they are. And they had, they had a, a really, really ambitious IPv6 rollout plan. I was absolutely floored at how quickly they were looking at rolling things out and how many people were in this meeting on this extended team involved with IPv6 rollout. And so I said, at one point after they had detailed their plans, I said, what is the huge rush for you guys? What is prompting you guys to move to IPv6 so quickly? And they said, well, they said the two fastest growing markets for us are China and Brazil. And they said, particularly in China, we can't get any IPv4 address space. And I said, well, why do you need it? They said, well, all the telemetry on all of our big tractors and combines and stuff, it's all IP-based. He said, we need to be able to talk to those things to figure out what's wrong with them. They need to phone home in order to tell us, you know, how many hours they've operated and, you know, what the oil pressure is and all this. So, you know, even in, in industries that don't maybe classically seem like networking industries, there's enough networking going on that they actually need IPv6 address space. Another, another uh, company where we actually visited, this is a regional um, uh, U.S. airline, um, we went and visited them, and, and we were talking to them about the new IPv6 features in, in our products, uh, which do DNS and DHCP and IP address management and stuff like that. We said, isn't this cool? You know, the next upgrade you do, you'll get all these IPv6-related uh, uh, features. And they said, no, we don't care about that. We said, we don't have any plans to go to IPv6. So we kind of slunk away with our tail, tails between our legs. And they called us up a few weeks later, and they said, uh, you got to come back out and talk to us about IPv6. And we said, well, what, what changed? And they said, well, one of our biggest airline network partners is KAL, and KAL just called us and said, we're moving all of our internet-facing systems to IPv6. So they got dragged along whether or not they wanted to. That's one of the things that um, I was going to point out. It's very practical to think that you can change your network in a couple of weeks. Yeah. So you're doing refreshes, you're doing hardware refreshes, you're doing software refreshes, you're, you're working on applications. Now is the time to have V6 in mind so that everywhere you're building is in that direction. So when the time comes, it's a matter of turning it up as opposed to going, oh, I've been spending money in the wrong direction all this time, and you know, I'm now fired, and there's a new guy in managing it. Right? So, right, right. Or I bought some gear that actually doesn't support IPv6, exactly and right. I bought it six months ago, and yep. it won't be refreshed for three years. Yeah, that's particularly an issue if you if you have a firewall or something like that. That firewall at your internet perimeter is the key point in the start of that uh, that process. You can't be six and your website if it sits behind the firewall. That's V4 only. Yeah. Great. So so in there, I think in in the early parts of that, at least, I heard a couple of drivers for enterprise deployment. Right, one being the VPN issue. One being customers uh, outside of uh, the region. Uh, what are the other drivers specifically, or specific to enterprises with with, that, with regard to IPv6? We I mean, uh, we all understand IPv4 address exhaustion is happening. Um, are there other reasons? What are there other key um, things that you should bring up with the uh, with uh, your management or, or whoever you need to get a, approval for to roll out IPv6? Shannon, you have any thoughts on that? Perhaps. I have thoughts. <laughs> so hopefully you can hear me okay. Um, it's a bit noisy here. I'm at BM World in San Francisco, so we're kind of shoved in the corner here trying to uh, trying to make this video feed work. But you know, I, I think it's I think the primary driver has already been stated, uh, you know, by the other panelists, and that is you know really trying to figure out you know how do you respond to these pressure points. I always refer to them as internal and external pressure points, and and for many years the enterprise pressure point was non-existent really. It was uh, the Oracles or the Microsofts of the world that were trying to build overlay networks inside their enterprise to be able to support developers and so forth. Um, and it's only really been in the last few months that we've really seen this, this massive movement to have due diligence in the way you represent your company um, 
through uh, internet services. And, and so, I, you know, I know that we're always hunting for that next other driver for enterprise, but I would argue that if you uh, sell or evangelize your, your company over the public internet in any way, whether it be directly or via a cloud provider or a hosting provider or whatever it might be, that is, that is important enough. That is, a, that is enough work to be focused on uh, to try to get your content and your services uh, available over, over the internet. And so while there's specific industry things, I mean, we've seen stuff, uh, you know, through automotive manufacturers that are doing, you know, BMW and GM that are moving IPv6, uh, uh, you know, overlay networks into Onsar and so forth. Um, you know, there are vertical specific use cases that are very relevant to the use, the proactive use of IPv6 that's not bound just to address exhaustion. Uh, but I would say that the, the foremost concern, uh, you know, and Cricket pointed out, you know, with John Deere, and I've worked with several pharmaceuticals that have the exact same problem uh, with branch connectivity to China plants. Um, so it, it's, a, it's a major issue that, uh, that's got to be dealt with. And I think that's probably the one that we're going to be focused on here for the next year or two. Sure. So the question I'll repeat it so Shannon can hear. The question was about mobile devices and the pro the proliferation of mobile devices and how that will uh, exacerbate the issue. I, I had just one data point on that, uh, w which I thought was remarkable. Uh, Mary Meeker gave a talk at uh, the D10 conference a few weeks ago, and and she cited the statistic that year-over-year -year growth in 3G subscribers in India, and, and 3G subscribers, of course, have a form of Internet access, was 841%. And that after that 841% growth, the total penetration in India was 4%. So <laughs> you, can, you can imagine how quickly, uh, how quickly things can grow in, in the mobile world. And actually, it's, you know, I think that in, in a lot of the developing world, a lot of the uh, internet access that we're going to see is via mobile because of the lack of lack of wired infrastructure. Yeah, back home, Bob is alive and well in some of these other other countries. Uh, so deploying, you know, just even civic planning and finding the rights of ways and easements in some of these other uh, cities is, is challenging. So wireless is an easy easy thing to do. Um, you know, we all probably have multiple devices that we're carrying around, and if you take that seven billion people, you calculate how many people can, well, you don't even need to read or write your native language to operate an iPad or something like that. Uh, but the number of devices that a person may have that wants to reach the internet, uh, I often say if it's, if it's a mobile device, it's just a couple hundred dollars, it will need to communicate to the internet in some way, shape, or form, either to get firmware updates or anything like that. You know, think of all the little, things inside your house that need an address, um, not just mobile devices inside your house, but they all need to communicate with the with the internet. And going through a carrier grade NAT system or multiple layers of NAT, they may have applications on those mobile devices that may start to fail when you move to when you move to multiple layers of, of NAT. Uh, so we would want them to be V6 capable as well, and, and many are actually. Uh, a mobile service provider definitely has motivation to explore if they can make those mobile devices be V6 capable, because then that removes any any limit on the number of mobile subscribers they can have. If they can get a system that works well and provides all the applications that you know a mobile user wants to get uh, access to on the IP, on the internet, uh, you know if, if that mobile device becomes V6 capable and now Facebook is you know is V6 capable. You know, my daughter is perfectly happy. Like I say, you know, uh, a SIP phone call over IPv6 sounds remarkably similar to a SIP phone call over IPv4. You know, if, you, if the carrier can make that transition, the end user experience is preserved. Um, you know, and if you can get, if you can text, you know, that's all my kids care about. If they can text over IPv6, the end user should not be aware of what's happening behind behind the curtain. And those mobile providers are moving in that way. Uh, 3GPP, uh, 4G, some of those systems even mandate the use of IPv6 in, in some cases. Yeah, I think to extend on that, it's it's not just about mobile devices, but device count, you know, period. I mean, you know, go, go talk to the Comcast guys and figure out why their control plane environment 
uh, needed to go to IPv6 to manage all the CPEs, right? So multiple uh, RFC 1918 spaces being chewed up. So, you know, I, I do a lot with financials, and they are the most merger and acquisition group you can possibly imagine as, as a vertical industry. And, and so for years, these guys have been trying to figure out how do I combat NAT overlap issues when I get multiple entities together that are all running RFC 1918, right? It's a, it's a colliding address-based uh, issue. And man, wouldn't it be cool um, if I didn't have to deal with that anymore uh, and just be able to use IPv6 with non-colliding spaces and no matter if I sold off or acquired or merged or resized, uh, that uh, I would have the flexibility of doing that from no other advantage of IPv6 but sheer address capacity, right? And so um, it's, it's really about all types of devices in really any industry and, and certainly mergers and acquisitions is one place where we're really seeing a lot of growth for, for v6 usage. Yeah, I read a, uh, an article maybe a year ago in The Economist magazine, and there was just a little blurb in there that I, I really enjoyed. It kind of struck me. He said that probably by 2015, the term smartphone will go out of existence simply because all phones will be smartphones, and there's no differentiator anymore. And if you really think about what a smartphone is, it's primarily an Internet-enabled phone, uh, which means IP services. Um, and uh, Cricket uh, mentioned... Um, you know, if you look at countries like uh, primarily China, India, uh, some African countries, one of the primary, if not the primary, ways that people access the internet in those countries is on their mobile phone. Um, and the first time, just a, a little anecdote, the first time this ever struck me was was around 2004, 2005, somewhere in there. I was uh, in China doing an interview about IPv6 with, with a Chinese newspaper, and the reporter uh, was asking me about IPv4 address depletion and such, and you know that was when we were all doing big song and dances about V4 address depletion, and you need to be ready. And the, uh, the example I gave at the time where the state of V4 address depletion was at that time was, you know, there are about uh, 1.2 billion uh, IPv4 addresses left in the world right now, in you know, 2004, 2005, whenever this was. And I said, if you think about that, if you give one IPv4 address to every person in the population of China, you're done. Um, you know, and, and, uh, and then I sort of chuckled and said, well, of course, I realize that not everybody in in uh, China uh, probably is, is ready for internet access right now. And the reporter said, well, you know, they may not have computers, but I bet every one of them has a mobile phone. And, um, and that stuck with me to this day, um, you know, that, that mobile is probably one of the biggest drivers, as, as Shannon said, in terms of just device density on the internet. Uh, mobile devices are, are going to be a major factor. All right, thanks everybody. Uh, we're going to come back and uh, get started again here. I kind of wanted to just kick off the second half of the panel here and, and, and basically admit I, I'm convinced. Uh, I believe now that uh, IPv4 address exhaustion is a clear and present danger to my business and, uh, and that CGN will not uh, take me all the way. It may be a half major. It may get me long enough to be able to deploy IPv6, but eventually I have to deploy IPv6. So um, where do I start, right? Where in the enterprise? Should I begin with uh, IPv6 deployment? It, should I, you know, I, I've heard different stories of you know start internally so my guys can get used to it. I've heard start externally so my customers can use it before I have to really deal with the problems of internal deployments. Uh, or maybe really the best thing is to start in a lab. But what are, what are your uh, thoughts here? From anyone? I'll go ahead. Um, I think the logical place is to start at where you connect to the internet because uh, it has to be IPv6 has to be rolled out contiguously. You don't want to have a pocket of IPv6 internally, have systems think that they're v6 capable, then when they go and do a DNS query for google.com, they get back an A and a quad A you know, DNS record today. They think they're v6 capable, they try and make the connection to Google over IPv6, and it's actually broken. There is no contiguous path on IPv6 to reach Google. So, if you, so that would be a risk for some system if you tried to deploy it internally. If you deploy it externally, you kind of move it into your organization one stop, one hop at a time. But really, I think the near-term goal is to 
V6 enabled the internet perimeter. That's where you have your content. That's where you're doing business and communicating with, with your customers, where your email server exists. You know, that's what communicates with, with the vast majority of the other internet population, and that's a good place to start. And that's what the, the U.S. federal agencies are trying to, to strive for, is at least get that far. Here's their first goal. Their next goal in 2014 is to try and move it further into their, their enterprises. Um, that's the first step. Yeah, I, I would entirely agree with that for enterprises. And, and interestingly, most most of my consulting work is with is with service providers. And my answer for service providers would actually be just the opposite of that. Um, you know, simply because the nature of that business, the nature of their networks, their their transit networks, and in that particular case, it probably is best uh, to start with the core network. Uh, for one thing, that's the low-hanging fruit. Uh, you know, most of your core devices are um, are almost for sure going to already be IPv6 capable, or can be IPv6 capable with with a software upgrade. Um, and then moving out from from the core, so you know your management systems, your security systems, and then your access systems come last. So you don't actually have to touch your customer until the very end. And 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 uh, as Chris said. Uh, in stating the question, you know, that gives you a chance uh, for your operations people uh, to become educated and learn how to work with IPv6 and so forth before they actually have to deal with customer traffic over IPv6. So, so different answer for, for service providers than for enterprises, um, and, uh, and which kind of goes back to the whole idea that for most, of, most enterprises, um, you know, the drivers are also somewhat different. Yeah, I, I'd agree that for most enterprises, it makes more sense to start at the DMZ. And, and you may never, in fact, go sort of outside in, or at least it, you may not for the foreseeable future, because right now, most of the people you want to serve who have IPv6 clients are outside, right? They're in Asia or increasingly in Europe. And you know you probably can make do with RFC 198 address space internally unless you're a very 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 large enterprise. Um, we we do actually have a, a few of those customers, but for the time being, there's probably not uh, an imperative to roll out IPv6 internally, but there arguably is external. Okay, and, and yeah, I mean, I, I, go ahead, John. Sorry. No, go ahead. I mean, I I think that it, it's an it depends exercise, right? It is it is not the same for everyone there. And you also don't need to look at, and I take Scott's point is perfectly spot on um, as it relates to building a pathway from the outside to the inside if that's your mission critical task. But I also think that you very much in large enterprise environments don't have the same people managing Internet Edge and all the infrastructure associated with it as you do the rest of the core internal data center, branch, and so forth. So you can simultaneously, for two different justifications, actually do your implementation at the same time, and they can be independent of one another. Um, so, you know, I mean, we've seen over and over again, again, you know, Panasonic and Hitachi and other people, Sony for sure, um, that have built uh, islands of IPv6 to connect disparate developers from all over the world because they're actually writing software for Sony, you know, TV sets and chipsets that are V6 enabled while a completely different team is working on the Internet Edge problem. So it's not really a, an inside or outside uh, type of solution. You can do multiple uh, you know, deployment methodologies at the same time, where at, the, at some point you're going to light up DNS, and DNS is what's going to run you or break, you know, make you. Um, and, and that really will be uh, you know, the true test of your infrastructure as it relates to continuity is when you add these applications through a name space, that's when you reveal that you, you do things correctly or not. And so you don't want to do that until uh, everything is is got a good clean pathway. Actually, I kind of wanted to ex expand on this topic a little bit more. Um, yeah, it's not an either or thing. It's not run v4 or v6. It's you're going to run both and make systems bilingual, but. It's, it's a worthwhile exercise to think about, well, what could I make the IPv6 only? And I think there are some small places where you could make your environment be IPv6 only, and those would be the places where you had the, most, the newest equipment. 
with the newest software and the newest uh, hardware. And that might be in a, in a new modern data center. For example, a new modern data center, you might be able to make it V6 capable in and of itself, the virtualization layer, the hypervisor layer. You, you could make a data center V6 and then use some kind of reverse um, application layer gateway or proxy server that proxies V4 and, and makes the legacy V4 internet access those things in the data center that are V6 only. So that may be one place where you could do V6 only, but I think the vast majority of locations, just I think the first goal would be to make them dual protocol. So I have more of my own questions, but I want to make sure we give the audience a chance to, uh, to jump in uh, if you have any questions. In fact, I think I have uh, some pretty cool World IPv6 launch patches that will go out. Uh, I have seven of them, so the first seven questions will we'll get a World IPv6 launch patch. Can a panelist ask a question to get one of them? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> So I'll repeat the question if I can real quick. Uh, the, the question was how does uh, IPv6 allocation work and how does it compare to IPv4 allocation, particularly the early days of IPv4 when we were giving out classical addresses, uh, you know, A, B, and C blocks, uh, is, 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 and how does V6 look today? Right? I, I mean, it does depend somewhat on the regional internet registry that you're going to, and that, of course, depends on whether or not you're going to a regional internet registry or an ISP. But um, Scott and I, uh, as, as part of the InfoBlox IPv6 Center of Excellence, we work with Owen DeLong, who's at Hurricane Electric and is on the advisory council for, for Aaron. And, uh, you know, he, he sort of you know, pounds it into us the way that we're, you know, this is the way that you're supposed to, supposed to handle allocation. Basically, Aaron's recommendations are uh, go to them. If you have a single site that's connecting to the internet, um, they'll give you minimally a slash 48. And past that, if you have multiple sites, then basically what you do is you move left off the slash 48, but you move by nibble boundaries, right? So you're always going to want a full nibble, uh, which basically means you know the prefix length is divisible by, by four, evenly divisible by four. So if you've got you know, three sites or whatever, they'll they'll give you um, what would that be a slash 44, right? And if you've got you know more than 16 sites, they'll give you a slash 40 and so on. We actually have heard um, from from somebody or other, I'm trying to remember who it was, that, that Columbia, I think Columbia got something incredible like a slash 18 from from right, which is just astounding. I mean, that's that's two to the 110th uh, IP addresses, which is, it's hard to imagine Columbia Pictures putting out that many movies, but maybe they have ambitious plans. Oh yeah. So um, depending on your regional registry, you would you might qualify for provi provider independent address space. If you're multiply homed, if you have an autonomous system number today and you're multiply homed, you have your own public V4 address space that you pay Aaron dues on, and you have an ASN that you pay Aaron dues on. You might qualify for a provider independent block that you could advertise to your BGP peers, to your upstream ISPs, just like you advertise your public V4 address space today. If you're a small organization, though, that has only a single ISP, you're not multiply homed, you would get provider assigned address space from your service providers. So there would be some measure of vendor lock in there. Uh, but IPv6 provides the, the ability to overlay or, or to transition or, <coughs> or readdress fairly easily, maybe a little easier than IPv4. Yeah, and kind of going the other direction, if you, if you are um, a smaller, and I don't know if I want to even say smaller enterprise, but you know, if, if you're taking an allocation directly from your local internet registry or your service provider uh, because you're single homed, uh, sort of the, the practice that seems to be um, coming out there, common practice is for their larger customers, they'll do a 48-bit prefix. For medium-sized customers, it's 56. And then if you are um, a home network or a small office network, 
you get a you get a 64-bit uh, prefix, which which is basically just a single subnet. But even there, uh, for some providers, there's some discussion of, well, you know, even in homes, even though most homes are going to probably just always be, you know, or most uh, small offices are always just going to be a single subnet. Um, you know, we, we maybe could foresee somewhere in the future where they want to have multiple subnets, uh, you know, or, or systems themselves uh, derive multiple subnets. And so there's some compromise even there of, of, of some service providers talking about for even homes and small offices doing a 60-bit um, uh, prefix so that they basically can, can have 16 subnets within that, uh, 16 64-bit subnets. Um, so, um, you know, there, but th those are sort of the, seems to be the standard practice for, for service providers allocating uh, to their customers right now. Um, as voted as Tony, you said that Comcast has started doing IPv6 demo rollouts, especially here in the Denver area. I don't think it's made it to Springs yet, where we're from. Do you guys, can you talk to us about um, IPv6 deployment and how far it's penetrated into the residential and several market? Take part of that question here real quick. Um, Springs is, it does have IPv6, Perfect. and it's no longer a trial anymore. Oh, it is production. Cool. Uh, on Cadence, Cadence CMTS is in the Comcast network. There's a few more that are coming up, but okay. Cool. And I think so, just reach out to Comcast and get either join the trial or talk to their customer care center and. No more trial. Mm -hmm. Okay, so like communicate with your VCC Comcast like customer like care. Blow around and turn on V6 and it's like, bow, here's your slash support. Uh, yep, you, you turn on, as long as you have a DOCSIS 3 cable modem that we've turned up for V6, and then you have a uh, uh, router that supports DACPD, then you're good to go. Okay. How about other vendors? Do you guys have any? But well, one, one thing you might be, want to try is actually plugging your computer directly into your DOCSIS. Uh, 3.0 cable modem that might be able to then if it was a dual protocol operating system it would do the DHCP v6 uh, with, with Comcast you could see if you're at least in a v6 already you're v6 capable then it may be that your CPE device doesn't support IPv6 and then it would be a matter of going and getting a vendor that is, is v6 capable and Comcast has a website that can show you what vendors' devices work better with their service and, and what ones to avoid. Definitely. And then the other yeah, I've been on the Comcast uh, for, for a while, and there's uh, you've you know it started out of it's, at least in the in the Denver hub, um, all of the circuits that they had in there. The only thing that they supported for the longest time is what they call standalone computer, and that's exactly what Scott pointed out. You directly attach to it, and that was all you got, right? And um, so I've now been on their production dual stack service now, uh, probably three months plus or so. Um, with the you know just again like Scott pointed out, they got a website to fill it. You know you've got to have this uh, DOCSIS compliant box, and you got to have a CPE that'll uh, listen dynamically uh, through DHCP um, over the uh, CPE facing interface, and you you're rock and roll. And I it works beautifully on mine, and I never did anything. I just plugged it in, and it worked. It's always a good thing when people can plug it in and turn it on and it works. Um, but you can always go to the Comcast forums. And uh, on the Comcast forums, if you have issues, just put in there what your issue is. And then 10 to 1 says, I'll find it. And then I will ping you on it. Um, right now, I've been working with, with Scott. His house, he's having some issues. I think it's operator trouble, but we're going to figure that out. <laughs> I think it's my CPE. <laughs> That's right. Comcast is really leading the way with the Consumer Electronics Association trying to make sure that those consumer grade components really embrace IPv6. The IETF is trying to work uh, to create those minimum level of standards that CPE should should support uh, uh, RFC 6204 and RFC 6092, which is called simple security. You want to make sure that those, those systems are operating properly with IPv6, but you want to make sure those systems are also providing that staple filtering. One area of note here is with V6, you'll be using public address space inside. You'll be using global addresses inside your home. Um, today, you use network address translation and, uh, and a stateful filter that prevents inbound unsolicited connections to make your home secure. But when you have public addresses, global addresses of IPv6 inside your organization, 
security is really important. You want to make sure you have a CPE that, that performs that staple filtering. And you have home-based systems that use um, host-based firewalls. So Jeff was talking about, okay, well, you've got this last 64 in the house, and um, certainly that's kind of how we roll it out in all enterprise. But if I'm an enterprise and I say, hey, you've got to roll it out a slash 64 for your um, one floor or one kind of corner of your office, um, why would I want to roll out 18 quintillion IP addresses for, like, 50 users sure. on a slash 64? So we kind of talk about, like, you know, what's the, what's the advantage of the slash 64 and why do I have to? So to repeat the question, uh, you know, the question is a slash 64, which is kind of the recommended minimum uh, subnet for IPv6, can host up to 18 quintillion hosts, right? There's 18 quintillion addresses in there. Um, so it's 18 trillion, 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 I think, is the right number of zeros. Uh, so why would you ever want to do that, right? It, it, it seems like way too many. And if I can expand on the question a little bit to the panel, you know, I think um, my perception has been that moving from IPv4 subnetting and, and network planning to IPv6 subnetting and network planning is really a paradigm shift. Uh, one where you maybe move from thinking about individual addresses to thinking about networks. Uh, so it, maybe that'll help uh, let you guys expand on, on how to solve that problem. How do we think about network planning and subnetting in IPv6? Um, yeah, don't. <laughs> oh, go ahead, Shannon. So, and I, 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 you know, I, I always tell people that, you know, in the people world, we cared about the number of hosts and the number of networks, uh, and now we really don't care about the number of hosts. We only care, care about the number of networks. And, uh, and that's as, you know, to me, as big as the paradigm shift should ever be. And, um, and so, you know, we've got um, a whole slew of customers that run uh, the entire gamut of, of prefixes size. You know, we've got them that, that run 64s everywhere. We've got them that run 64s only on links where there's host, and they run 127s or, or you know, uh, 126s or whatever on point-to-point -point links. So there's no wrong answer um, as it relates to those, but you do need to understand um, some of the mechanics and some of the RFC rule sets around when you start manipulating bit boundaries on links where you have host, especially if you're doing uh, stateless address auto configuration and, and those types of things, you will start you know, violating RFCs and you will start violating your ability to actually functionally have host working properly on those links. So, um, you know, I, I don't think that there, it's a religious debate uh, on, on how you manipulate bit boundaries, but there are rule sets in place for specific uh, reasons why um, you don't want to be going and, and jerking around with, uh, with, your, with your prefix links too much. But, uh, you know, we always recommend keep it as simple as, as possible and you know, spend the rest of your day job doing important stuff. Yeah, I think IPv6 with the vast amount of address space gives us the opportunity to do what's easy to maintain. You know, IPv4 madness of slash 28, slash 29s, that's just mind-numbingly, you know, insane. If you just keep it simple and use a slash 64 everywhere, it's easy to, you know, to maintain. Yeah, it's it, sort of the, the, the quick little blurb with all of my customers when we're talking about IPv6 address design that I say up front is forget almost everything you uh, ever learned about IPv4 address design. Um, and, uh, you know, and while that sounds a little flippant, uh, what's behind it is that pretty much the primary motivation for, for any IPv4 address design is address conservation. You know, you've, got, you've got to carefully that to make sure you've got enough subnets and enough hosts on that subnet and all that sort of thing. With IPv6, it's such an incredibly larger, uh, astronomically larger address space that you can afford to be wasteful. Um, and, uh, you know, and the trade-off there is, is that you have a lot more flexibility, you can put a lot more consistency in your network, um, and that sort of thing. Um, you know, if you think about sort of uh, on the large side of, of prefix allocations, if you get a 32-bit prefix allocation, which is you know, usually going to go to a service provider or a very large enterprise or something like that, but if you get a 32-bit IPv6 address allocation, um, within that, you've got as many 64-bit uh, subnets as there are 
uh, IP addresses in the entire IPv4 address space. You know, and, and as, as multiple people have said, you know, each one of those slash 64s has got 18 million trillion addresses in it. Um, and um, the, the other piece of that, and, and it was mentioned a little bit as, as, as far as, you know, people that just, I think, aesthetically have a really hard time um, with the idea of just putting slash 64s everywhere. Um, you know, if you, it's, it's because they have a hard time looking at just how big that address space is. Um, interestingly, where it, where it often comes up is on point-to-point -point links. Um, and, you know, people will say, well, you know, I, ju I just can't accept the idea that I'm going to put a slash 64 on all my point-to-point -point links. And, you know, there's, there's 18 million trillion addresses and I'm only ever going to use two of them. Um, and my kind of reply to that is, okay, but you're using slash 64s on your LANs. Um, and you seem to be okay with that. Well, yeah. Uh, okay, well, how many devices do you figure you're going to put on your LAN? You know, is, is 500, you know, a reasonable number? Is 1,000 a reasonable number? You know, is it up to whatever, you know, your switch tables will handle, uh, let's say, 1,000 devices? Well, yeah, that's pretty acceptable. Okay, well, the difference between 1,000 devices or 1,000 addresses and two addresses out of 18 million trillion addresses is negligible. Um, you know, and, and so it's, it's really a challenge to change your way of thinking and, um, and think more about the flexibility that you, that you have out of that uh, subnet consistency as a trade-off for wasting a huge number of addresses and yet we can afford to do that. Yeah, I believe in, in waste not, want not. I think it's good to, you know, if you can, get a hybrid car and use you know, energy efficient light bulbs and recycle plastic, aluminum, and paper. But recycling or saving the ones and zeros, whether it's 128 bits of ones or 128 bits of zeros, they use about the same amount of electricity. <laughs> and so uh, you want to do what's easy. Uh, it makes it easy to operate a network because the operational expenses of running a network maybe far exceed the capital expense of the hardware even. So do what's easy, you'll, you'll save yourself a lot of headache, make it easier to troubleshoot. You'll see that with IPv6, maybe in the long run, you might have less operational expenses eventually when you move to v6 only. The, the one thing that I point out to, to the real nervous Nellies who think, wow, we, we could actually exhaust um, the IPv6 address space that we're carving up for global unicast is that remember that the, the current IPv6 global unicast space is all allocated out of the prefix 001, right? So we're actually only dealing right now with an eighth of the overall IPv6 address space. So if we've completely blown it, and by giving out these enormous pieces of address space, these, these very short prefixes to Sony Pictures or whomever, we, we really do run out eventually. We can start over almost seven times, right, using different prefixes. At that point, we'll all be dead, so it won't be our problem. <laughs> is, uh, is multicast, the concept of multicast, does it leave when you go to V6? Sure, so the question is, uh, does the concept of multicast leave when you go to multi IPv6, or, or basically, how does, IP, how does multicast uh, operate in IPv6? Uh, real close to the way it does in IPv4, it's just a lot more fun and important now. <laughs> right, because, you know, I mean, it, it, it's, it's well, one, uh, multicast is now required in IPv6 from a, from a control plane and a mechanical functionality that relates to IPv6. It was kind of a, an optional function that we used in IPv4 for specific use cases. But now that we've gotten rid of broadcast and we're completely based on multicast for things uh, such as neighbor discovery and router solicitation and all of those types of things, we get you know on-link multicast as a required mechanical function of IPv6. When you move above link local and you start looking at traditional um, you know PIM uh, type of uh, multicast functionality, most of that um, is nearly identical, with the exception of some configuration changes as what you're used to in IPv4. So if you're a, 
you know, a PIM sparse mode, BSR, you know, um, any cast uh, kind of good through um, outside of whacking, uh, you know, these ridiculous looking hexadecimal addresses in your CLI, um, you're going to be quite comfortable with the multicast functionality that you get in IPv6. I think that the security concerns around IPv6 are, are pretty fundamental ones. Um, I'm, I'm much less concerned about the use of global unicast addresses on devices inside the network because I think that there are, you know, security professionals who will learn how to configure the firewalls to not allow traffic to devices that it shouldn't be allowed to. I think that there, there are more basic issues, um, and one of those is just operator error. You know, we're less familiar with the format of IPv6 addresses. We're uh, less familiar with hexadecimal math, and so we're going to make some mistakes. The implementations of the stacks, the support for IPv6 and things like firewalls and IDSs and IPSs is not as mature as the support for IPv4, and so there are bugs that have yet to be found and stomped. And, uh, you know, I think, I think those are our, our basic sort of you know, human nature, software engineering problems that are, are kind of inevitable when you're when you're moving to a new technology. But I don't, I mean, I, I can't think of anything that I think is sort of inherent in IPv6, like, oh God, this is going to, this is going to come to bite us. Um, yeah, the, you know, issues related to ARP or the neighbor discovery protocol are very similar to each other. Uh, there's weaknesses in both, and we, we seem to sleep soundly at night knowing that our IPv4 networks are vulnerable to some ARP-related act activities. Um, at, at the internet perimeter, you know, we're going to add v6 to our environment, but it's not going to change our topology. We'll still have a, a perimeter. You'll still have, you know, firewalls and IPSs and, and, and systems there to protect those, those systems. And in a data center, you'll have security, and, and you'll still have the same layered uh, and defense in depth and diversity of defense uh, systems that you have today. The issue that you want to be aware of is if your vendor hasn't given you full feature parity for v4 and v6. Let's say you're relying on a particular web application firewall to protect your web application because you know the application is vulnerable to a cross-site scripting attack or something like that, and you're using this web application firewall to protect it. If that web application firewall is v4 only, and then you suddenly take our advice and turn up that web application with v6, the attacker will definitely know that there's a weakness over v6 that can be exploited that couldn't be exploited over v4, and you'd only be as strong as the, the the weakest of those two protocols. So you want to know where you might have um, you know, a weakness there, or where your vendor doesn't have full feature parity. You want to make sure the vendors know that, that, that that's what you expect. And if you know that there's going to be a substantial weakness, maybe don't turn on v6 in that, in that system until you have that uh, equal parity of v4, v6 security. Yeah, I mean, I think all of us uh, will, will always recommend to every customer that they go through a very thorough gap analysis, uh, you know, an inventorying process and everything else. And, and, you know, if you're looking at a branch router or as, or as you know, uh, Scott pointed out, you're, you're, you're looking at a web application firewall or any other device, and you're going to marry up um, a list of what is it that I use today in a V4-only world and what is it that I absolutely have to have in the V6 side and what would I like to have. And, then, and at some point, every, every specific, you know, customer case is different, they'll reach this what I call threshold of acceptability, where they'll, they'll find out that there's this threshold that says, okay, I've got three of 15 features under branch router um, that are not there in IPv6. But the reality of it is, is those three features are kind of nice to have, and they will not hinder me from moving forward. Um, if that feature list is you're missing 14 of 15, um, and they're, they're mission critical, critical to the functionality of that device, then as Scott pointed out, that, that's when you, you put on the brakes until you figure out how to close those gaps, right? And that could be just simply software change, hardware change, or a vendor change, right? It's just all depending on what your, your life cycle is, your, your time to deliver the service, um, and really, you know, 
where it is that, that you need to get to as a goal. And so I think that uh, everybody is going to have to go through an inventory process that, and, and kind of remediate a gap analysis before they really move forward on, on the deployment side. Doing, doing it without that kind of thorough analysis is an absolute disaster. Yeah, and, and um, as far as security goes, I you know I have to say that when when my own clients uh, ask about IPv6 security, my general answer is I know this guy named Scott Hogue, and here's his phone number. Um, but uh, so, something that that Cricket said that I it's just totally tangential to to this, but but I didn't want to let that opportunity pass uh, is uh, working with hexadecimal numbers, um, and. You know, there's a lot of people that look at IPv6 addresses and are just completely intimidated by that. Um, but I was teaching introduction to Cisco or intro, intro, Cisco introduction to networking classes back in the early 1990s. And I remember back then uh, presenting dotted decimal formats and people are going, how in the world are we ever going to remember that? That looks really complex. You know, and, and how many dotted decimal IPv4 addresses are stuck in your head now? Uh, you know, nobody's intimidated by that anymore. What I found, just personal experience from working with IPv6 addresses and hexadecimal, is they're a lot easier to work with. Um, it takes a while to get used to it, but you start learning what to ignore and what to pay attention to. And if your address design is good, I mean, doing uh, hex to binary conversions in your, you can do that in your head, whereas, um, you know, uh, uh, decimal to binary conversions, you know, you usually have to pull out a piece of paper or a calculator or something like that. But, but um, you know, I, I think that in the long run, the fact that IPv6 addresses are in hexadecimal is, is going to actually make managing IPv6 uh, addresses a lot easier. It's the only reason I got into IPv6 because I'm an old IPX guy and I love that. <laughs> I got into IPv6 because uh, Nat wasn't on my CCIE lab exam. It was 11.2, <laughs> and so I never learned that. Uh, I forgot my question. Um, so, so we talked a little bit about. Oh, uh, I go uh, for it. Is, no, I heard it. So um, we're a Cisco shop where I work. And um, I, I just want to find out from I know you guys obviously work with a lot of different vendors. How is it possible that we're still able to buy gear that doesn't have V6 native, like out of the box? And why is that a feature? Why do I have to pay for that? That's ridiculous. And what is that going to change? So, so the question was, uh, why are we still able to buy gear, especially from vendors as large as Cisco, that uh, doesn't have V6 in it? And why am I paying extra for V6? <laughs> Shannon's <laughs> looking. <laughs> I'm not in uh, engineering or in sales or in marketing, so reach out to your account team and beat them to death, or change vendors. I mean, it's it's just that simple, right? I mean, it, it's it's it, but but I'll, I'll I'll argue, given that I'm very close friends with other vendors that are our competitors as well, um, we all have problems, right? And so it's it's a travesty one that you're charged for it, and I think that if you look at across the Catalyst product sets, Nexus, and other systems, that you're seeing a Concerted effort. This comes all the way from John Chambers as a dick, you know, as basically a mandate inside the company is, "Thou shalt not charge more for IPv6." Now that takes a while to come through the licensing model, especially in the switching products. Um, but you'll you'll really see a movement towards IP as IP as IP, regardless of the version number that's sitting behind it. And so that that will will come um, and trickle down through the product sets is something that we don't charge for. But you also have to realize that your requirements for what is missing in a product are radically different than somebody probably sitting next to you. And when you combine um, a massive population of product sets, and this sounds like a horrible excuse, but it is a horrible excuse, um, is that it's very difficult to map up the top priority items that need to be IPv6 ified, if that's a word. Uh, Um, across every that we have, it's a very, very difficult problem to solve. Um, and that's why I'm not in product marketing or in product <laughs> engineering is because I refuse to do any of that. I, I would just say from, from my perspective, I am actually involved in, in the product side of things at Infoblox, and we, we did include IPv6 functionality in our DNS, DHCP, and IP address management product 
um, because basically it became table stakes within within our market. Um, I wouldn't say you know I wouldn't necessarily attribute any altruism uh, to the fact that we did it, but you know we did it, our competitors did it, and and that's sort of the standard in the IPAM market now. You don't charge extra for IPv6 functionality. So at this point, the market won't bear it because our competitors don't do it. I think Cisco, like other vendors, you know, want to you know do the right thing and, and add IPv6 capabilities to their product. They also need to remain competitive and continue to innovate with with IPv4. Um, but I think Cisco has has quite a bit of IPv6 capability, and, and they've made it a mandate and uh, across their product lines to try and uh, strive to achieve that. So I think, yeah, as, as Shannon mentioned, reach out to Cisco specifically if there's a specific product in mind. You should let the vendor know that that's what you want, because I think they maybe are gauging customer, uh, customer use or customer interest to prioritize their development uh, resources as well intelligently. And if they hear from you, you know you you have some you know budget that could make that happen. So I, I definitely encourage that's you to reach out to the vendors. Absolutely, that is the single largest problem we have is lack of feedback on requirements uh, because you as a customer coming to us and saying I need line by line for IPv6 parity will never work with any vendor. So what we need is the things that are absolutely important to you in a given product set and a given feature set across the timeline. That's exactly what the engineering teams will use to prioritize it. And, and so you know, we get that information from Google or JPMC or Wells Fargo or somebody like that. We'll feed that to us and we'll immediately move that stuff to the top of the heap. Um, but those customers in other industries that are not speaking up or giving us that level of detail, uh, you know, sadly um, are, are going to probably be missing a feature set on a product that they really, really need to get IPv6 on. And we may probably have never, ever heard from anybody about that. So it's incredibly important. Uh, to feed that stuff in through your account team. Um, if your account team won't listen, email me, and I'll get it directly to engineering. Um, one thing that maybe goes hand in hand with that, I don't know if I can turn this into a question or not, but um, as she said, you first have to define that list of what you actually need from IPv6, right? And then the second thing is, once you give that list to your vendor and get a product back, you absolutely have to take it into a lab and test it. Because the, one of the biggest problems I've seen from vendors with IPv6 is that you're not adding a feature to a given software, right? You're changing every feature in a given software, right? To, to, the, to add v6 support to any, any network OS, you're actually changing, you're turning knobs pretty much everywhere along the path. And so getting that equipment into the lab before you put it out into a deployment network, I think is uh, extremely important. So, so have that list and make sure you test that list after, after you sit, you know, you're told that it's, that it's good. Uh, in, in that light, I guess the question would be, you know, what other things do we need to consider um, to assess your own network for, for IPv6 readiness? Right? How, do, how do you know when you're ready to deploy IPv6? Um, I, think, I think you prioritize your, your rollout. Like we mentioned, if you're going to start at the Internet edge, those are the feature functionality you would need. You don't need to start to press on getting v6 capability in desktops very early on. You, you look at what's at the perimeter, and I think you, you order that list or order that inventory based on your deployment uh, method that suits your organization. If you're a service provider, you, you would order that list differently. You know, core networking would be your focus there. Um, I think DNS, having dual protocol DNS, externally facing authoritative DNS is going to be high on your priority list. I think early on is going to be a v6 capable firewall. Uh, you know, servers being you know capable of being dual protocol. Those are going to be the things that are that are early on your list. Things that are going to be far down on your list are going to be your heating, ventilation, air conditioning system inside the building, or a badge system, or a video surveillance system, or something closed system, or or that little RJ45 port on your you know data center UPS you know that sends SNMP traps about battery life issues. You know that's going to be low priority on your list. Printers, maybe low priority. You know, you're going to prioritize that list. You're, you want to look at everything, but you're going to prioritize that list on what's more important and what's more imminent to be dual protocol. Yeah, it, 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 being a bit more simplistic, um, you know, to, to me, it, 
after you figured out, you know, what out of your systems, where where do you really need to touch with IPv6? Um, you know, just as a generalized principle, you know, it doesn't make sense to deploy anything you can't manage, and it doesn't make sense to deploy anything you can't secure. So always the challenge is, in my opinion, not so much the 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 direct networking equipment or servers or what whatever it's the management systems and the security systems um, that that are really the challenge of of of, a, um, of an IPv6 deployment. So uh, I think Jeff mentioned. I mean, I think the first priority would be making sure you could pass IPv6 packets in the data plane and have control plane that you know and routing protocols that could share routes to get a packet from a source to a destination address. The management plane should be v6 capable and should be able to communicate v6 information to the device, but it, that transport may be IPv4. So we're going to talk over IPv4, you know, with SNMP, but we're going to talk about IPv6 capable SNMP mid values. So two different concepts here. So the management plane may be v4 transport, but it absolutely must be v6 aware of, of what's happening to those devices. Hey, I just wanted to, to remind you, also, don't forget about actual network application. Has left the conference. You lost him. Yeah, I think we'll have to dial it back in. Okay. You know, in, in edge deployments, that's less of a concern because there's probably, you know, there are probably just a few well-known uh, applications that are actually running. I lost that too. No, that's fine. I was just right. turning it down so it doesn't okay. really loud when I dial back in. You know, you, you're worried about DNS, you're worried about HTTP, you're worried about SMTP. Over an internal network, if you are looking at an IPv6 uh, internal deployment, that's a different matter, right? You probably have a much wider variety of network applications running. Um, and, you know, DNS, HTTP, SMTP, we know they run over IPv6 really well. Who knows what kind of crazy network applications you might have in-house, right? Developed in-house, maintained in-house. I was at Disney last year talking about this. Welcome to BioWeb. And they were saying, well, you know, do we really have to Conference cut these job. applications over to IPv6? And I said, no, absolutely not. You know, you can run dual stack as long as you want to internally. And they breathed a sigh of relief. They said, we did an Please inventory. We've got over 10,000 internal network applications. And they sort of, you know, the run the gamut has from joined the conference. Uh, applications that are, are ready to go over IPv6. They have no problem. They would opportunistically use the transport if it were available and if the server published a, a quad A record. And then on the other hand, we have applications that were written 20 years ago. Uh, we don't have the source code anymore. The application developers are dead. And it, it, they use hard-coded IPv4 addresses within the protocol, so we're never going to be able to move those onto IPv6. I hope I missed a hard um, question. Uh, things that people miss, like, oh my gosh, I forgot my frame relay Delsi, and people are using that. Or, oh gosh, QoS, or, oh, holy smoke, my IP PBX. What are some common things that people miss? So the question was, what are the common things that people miss when deploying IPv6? Or what are the gotchas, that are at least the most common gotchas? So. Wow, that's a long list. <laughs> yeah, common gotchas may be, as Jeff mentioned, as you start to get your addresses, the first thing you do is you start to lay out an addressing plan and trying to avoid that IPv4 thinking. That's one of the very first gotchas you're going to encounter, addressing plan and thinking, oh, I've got all this address space. I'm going to stick a VLAN identifier in here, <laughs> and that's a decimal number, and it doesn't fit in a, in a hexadecimal number. It, those kind of things, avoiding those issues, you know, that'll be the first gotcha probably. What other gotchas you guys have? I, I don't know that this is exactly sort of this, this a answering in the spirit in which you meant the question, but one of the gotchas we ran into. Uh, early on when we got our v6 connectivity in InfoBlox was that uh, we went with an IPv6 provider who was already in our co-location facility and they could turn it up really easily and uh, they were relatively inexpensive and uh, it turned out 
that um, you know when we turned it up, when we got our web server up on IPv6, our IT manager uh, talked to me and he talked to one of the other um, product managers within the company. He said, hey, you guys have IPv6 at home. Can you test this out for me? We couldn't get to the website. And we thought, well, what the hell? So he checked it out from a, a website that he could use to test connectivity from you know this remote website to our website, and that worked fine. Well, eventually we found out that, that the provider that the PM, the product manager and I were using, doesn't peer with the provider providing the access. Um, they have a long-standing spat, and they won't talk to each other over IPv6. So uh, that was something that I guess we just didn't consider, that, uh, you know, the, that because we're in the sort of nascent period in, in the evolution of IPv6, there are providers who don't peer with each other. I mean, in the IPv4 world, that wouldn't last a day before you know, one of the two providers was dragged kicking and screaming into a peering agreement with, uh, with the other one. But in IPv6, apparently that can persist. Yeah, it's important to be aware of, you know, what v6 services your service provider have uh, or don't have. Um, public information to go and gather data about uh, who peers with who and, and things like that. That's all public, public information. The V6 internet isn't quite as meshy as the IPv4 internet because uh, it is in somewhat early stages. Uh, but I do show some AESs that have V6 uh, capability on my graph. Um, but you're right, you should be aware of if you wanted to peer with a Tier 1 ISP, that Tier 1 ISP may be a Tier 1 ISP in terms of their IPv4 peering, but they may not be a Tier 1 ISP in terms of their V6 peering. And you as a consumer of those services should know that, the, that there might be a difference between providers. Yeah, and, and on that note, be very watchful of your SLA, right? Because, because very often it will be exempt, or they'll claim it'll be the same, but if the language in the SLA is not the same to include the service availability requirements that you're paying in big fat money for, um, it's not present for IPv6, then, you know, one, they're either going to have to, which several providers that we've talked to historically, especially uh, in the UK, um, have done uh, specific SLAs for IPv6 that are different from IPv4 because they know just what Scott pointed out. They, they do not have parity in performance, availability, and monitoring. So, uh, you know, that's the kind of painstaking detail that you need to go through in your analysis way before you write a check to somebody. Um, is to make sure that, you know, you do have the service availability and the performance and stuff that, that you're, you know, hopefully getting um, at least a good percentage of that uh, as it compares to what you're doing with IPv4. Yeah, I've been charting every six, eight, nine months, you know, how providers have, have more upstream or downstream VGP peering, and it is really accelerating, and the service providers are making great strides, particularly in the last two years. So. What, what may be an issue with your service provider, you know, today may drastically change in the next nine months. So it's, it's a rapidly changing area. You see that the curve on that graph is really high. The service providers are really accelerating their deployments. One of the other things might go back to um, V4 and V6 feature parity, right? As we're talking about with security and with, with readiness, a lot of things, you, so a lot of those gotchas are just things that you take for granted in V4, right? So uh, there's a lot of pieces of your V4 network that you may not think of as necessarily networking, right? There's a lot of uh, interaction between various systems and various applications that when you turn on V6, it may work in five of them, but if it doesn't work in all six of them, you could have problems there as well. So actually going through and doing a really exhaustive um, kind of assessment of your network and, and what all touches your network and what all is actually IP in your network before turning on V6 uh, makes a lot of sense, I think. You got a question? You know, and I think that... Oh, that, ahead, to, to finish up to finish up that I mean that's not something that you have to do, do alone right if you if you engage in a partner um, you know a VAR of some sort uh, many of them are really starting to grow their assessment services if you're for example uh, you know a Juniper or a Cisco advanced services account or something like that then you, there is specific assessment uh, support that you can get where they can come and help inventory you know version of code and you know can you run uh, HSRP v2 with IPv6 and your train of iOS and, and that kind of stuff you don't have to build by hand in your favorite Excel spreadsheet you know uh, there are definitely the uh, partners and services that are out there that can kind of help you work through that remediation uh, you know and so if you don't have the headcount or the resources to do that that isn't 
mean that it's not going to get done. It can be, you know, it can be done through partnerships. Who out there has done an install in a live enterprise network today? An install of V6? So the question was who's done a live V6 install in an enterprise? Hands up, man. Yeah. Everyone? question from the service provider standpoint are and this is I guess for Jeff because you deal with most of the service providers are they generally deploying um, continuing to do island style deployments where they're deploying this pop as IPv6 enabled and they tunnel it across their existing v4 infrastructure or are they saying screw it they're going full blast and picking an interior routing protocol and deploying it everywhere like actual dual stack or is it mostly still tunnel these days uh, for, for service providers um, most service providers are running in PLS cores, um, and generally they're using that. So you could kind of say um, that they're tunneling everywhere, but but really tunneling everywhere in the same sense that they're tunneling IPv4. Um, uh, MPLS, if you already have an MPLS core, it's just it's a it's a wonderful uh, way of of getting IPv6 into your network. Um, so uh, you know, I, I think. Outside of, uh, of that and going more to sort of the context of what you were saying about islands of IPv6 and that sort of thing, I, th I think they're moving away from that. Uh, you saw that maybe five years ago where service providers were really trying to push IPv6 out just to wherever they had customers. Uh, but they're oriented a lot more now to just having, having uh, a homogeneous IPv6 edge uh, so that you know, they can, they can uh, serve any customer that wants IPv6. And obviously that varies from one service provider to another, but it's a very general statement there. It's the reason why I ask is interesting because you know we peer with level three, and it's like, yeah, level three, I want to get you know V6 native peering with you guys, and they say, oh, we got to span this VLAN from this router on Pearl Street because nothing else has V6 in Denver, so we got to move your B2B session over here, and it's just like, are you serious? Like you can't? I mean, like I'm already here. You can't just this router doesn't have it, and their answer is, nope. And, and I just find that very surprising across our vendor selection. That said, we have found that Cogent and AT are both like V6 everywhere, 10,000, and we'll hear at the level three, it seems for us at least to be dragging their feet. And I just didn't know if that's the case across a lot of the vendors or not. No, not that I know of. So as we start to uh, run out of time here, I think maybe the best last question uh, would be, uh, where, where do we go for more information? Right? Is there? Uh, Organizations or websites or books or what's your best recommendation for learning more after uh, after we've got a taste today? I often tell people to go to Wikipedia and type in IPv6 and now Wikipedia is an IPv6 capable website. Um, so that's a great place to you know start learning and surf around and find other parts of, of what you're interested in IPv6. Uh, there's some good introductory books out there. Uh, the the Rocky Mountain uh, IPv6 Task Force uh, puts on an IPv6 conference every year here in Denver. Uh, pretty low cost to attend, uh, and we've had it here in Denver for five years. It's actually the largest IPv6 conference in North America. Uh, but the website, the www.rmv6tf.org uh, website, being a dual protocol website, uh, naturally, has all of the conference presentations from the last five years of our of our event. So you can go there and find presentations uh, from a lot of folks uh, on specific subjects that may be of interest to you. Uh, that's a good place. Um, I, I just briefly plug uh, my group's uh, website, which is on the InfoDocs website, it's www.infodocs.com slash IPv6. And we, we've got some resources there that might be helpful to you if you're interested in sort of getting started. We have um, a, a white paper and a big poster on sort of getting connected via IPv6. Um, Scott helped us with that, helped do the, the tech review on that. Uh, we have a, an accompanying webinar that I think we've recorded. That's one of the guys who works for me, Tom Coffin, doing that. And then we also have um, a white paper and then um, Tom's also put together some instructional information on how to put together an IPv6 addressing plan, uh, including a sample IPv6 ad addressing plan um, as a as a example. Uh, I I would 
mention that Shannon has an excellent book on IPv6 and the enterprise. Highly recommend it. Hey, Chris, don't forget. I Thank you, Jeff. I'll pay you later. <laughs> Chris, ISOCs deploy 360. I mean, since they're sponsoring us. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, yeah, ISOC has started a, what they call the Deploy 360 program, which is uh, its goal is to basically provide education, provide information on networking topics kind of across the gamut. And obviously, one of the areas they've started with, because there's a huge skills gap today, is with IPv6. Uh, they've been doing it with their ION uh, events as well as the uh, INET events. They've been doing quite a bit of outreach uh, throughout the world, actually, uh, for IPv6 events. Uh, Aaron, as well, and all the other re regional internet registries have quite a bit of information posted up. Uh, and there's also um, IPBCOP.org. It's the Best Current Operational Practices, uh, which is a, a brand new organization that was formed kind of out of the Aaron and Nano communities to start presenting living documents written by engineers for engineers. And again, what, the topics that they've tackled initially have been uh, IPv6 related to kind of address that skills gap. Yeah, I would also recommend Shannon's book on IPv6 Enterprise uh, Deployments from Cisco Press. Um, I'd say www.cisco.com slash go slash IPv6. Right, Shannon? Absolutely. Uh, Aaron has a IPv6 wiki, get IPv6, uh, so Aaron.net. Uh, you'll find it right there on their main page. Um, the American Registry for Internet Number really wants to you know, help perpetuate um, and advocate IPv6. They want you to come get your addresses uh, from them, so they have some good information there.